Hi, I'd like to welcome Mike Johnson uh, to the Computer History Museum. Uh, my name is Kevin Crewell. We're going to do an interview uh, discussing Mike's life history and, and how he got involved in IBM and AMD's uh, processor business over, the, uh, over his career. Um, Mike, could you uh, start by introducing yourself, your name, title, and, and what are you doing these days? Okay, I'm uh, Mike Johnson. I'm uh, actually CEO of a small company uh, called Mirreplica. Uh, technology, and I can't say much about what we're doing, but it's, I think it's kind of the computer architecture equivalent of a mind-blowing substance, so <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> well, we can take that in a lot of different directions, but obviously it's, yeah, uh, it's it, under NDA. It in good, uh, good directions. Good directions, oh yeah, that's good. So um, can you give us a little background on where you're from and, and uh, what it was like growing up? Okay, so I'm originally from Charleston, West Virginia, yeah. and it's not really known as a technology center, as I said before, uh, but my father was in the Navy, so I was always kind of around technology and, and pilots. He was a flight surgeon, and we moved um, up and down the East Coast pretty much and ended up in Arlington, Virginia when I was uh, going into high school, and we were there for three or four years before I went to college. And he was at the uh, Bethesda Hospital, so we were there. We got established a little bit, mm -hmm. and we the Arlington schools had some very nice infrastructure for getting hands-on experience with computers you know, using the old you know, Teletype 33 machines, I think is what they were called, mm -hmm. with punch tape, and you could program in BASIC and use timeshare machines. So I became fascinated with computers and, and electronics in general as, as part of that. So, the, so high school was when you first uh, started to become interested in, in computer programming and developing and working with computers? Yeah, I had always been interested in you know, building models and things like that, but uh -huh. when I discovered electronics and computers, it just, it just fascinated me. Okay, so is that how you just, uh, so um, when you went to college, did you decide the uh, computers were your thing or did that just come later on? How did well, you go to college? Well, it, 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 it was really, electrical engineering in general, or electronics in general. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, only, the reason I, the way I picked my major is I got the course catalog and flipped through to the first thing that said electrical and signed up for that major. And I could have been an electronic technician if it came after electrical <laughs> engineering alphabetically. I'm, I'm serious, that's how I picked, picked to become an electrical engineer. Now, which uh, school was that? Uh, Arizona State. Okay. Oh, that was a bit of a jump from uh, D.C. to Arizona. Yeah, I wanted to get, get out and see the world. And I had a, uh, I was on an Air Force ROTC scholarship, so I had a bit of flexibility in pick, picking where I went. And they had a lot of Air Force infrastructure in, in the Phoenix area at the time. I think they still do have one Air Force base. Mm -hmm. um, so I was interested in flying, too, because of the, the background that I had with the Navy. Mm -hmm. So I had kind of a foot in two worlds. And the original, um, the original plan was I was a pilot. I was pilot qualified, so I was supposed to spend four years getting my bachelor's, then a year in pilot training, and then pay back a year for every year that I had spent in training. So that would have been, you know, one year in pilot training and another five years, you know, being a, being an Air Force pilot. Uh, but I graduated in uh, 1975, and they had filled the pipeline with pilots for the Vietnam War. And so, you know, in 75, it was pretty much completely over. Mm -hmm. And I probably have one of the few commissions signed by Gerald Ford. So, so they told me, uh, you know, basically I can go, to, go into the Air Force at some point in time, right, but they were cutting back. <clears throat> and I was, you know, fairly high on the qualification list, so they weren't gonna just cut me loose. So they made me stick around and I couldn't get a real job because I had the Air Force commitment, but the Air Force wouldn't let me in. So uh, what I effectively did or essentially did was go, uh, go to graduate school and get a master's. Um, and while I was in graduate school, the Air Force sent me a letter effectively resigning themselves <laughs> to the fact that they didn't have enough people oh. who were voluntarily being let go. So they gave me what's called a palace option, which, um, the idea is you go, you go to active duty for three months and then you spend eight years on inactive reserve. Okay. And so I went to graduate school for a year, uh, was stationed in San Antonio 
for three months during the summer. It was kind of like a summer vacation. I got paid pretty well. Yeah, <laughs> and paid vacation. I went back to Arizona State in the fall and graduated in December. Okay. With a master's in, in electrical engineering? With a master's. And my, um, the master's research was in uh, hybrid control systems mm -hmm. and flight controls and that sort of thing. Yeah, so, so mixing the, t the loves of flying and, and electronics together. Yes. So what happened after that? Well, when I was in San Antonio, I had originally had this, uh, I guess, stereotypical view of Texas as, you know, flat tumbleweeds and, you know, nothing really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, it turns out that the, the area around San Antonio and Austin is, in some ways, reminds me a lot of where I grew up in West Virginia and Virginia. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, the climate's a little different, but the terrain is similar. There's lots of water and, you know, springs in those, th that area. Right. So when I went back to graduate school, I mean, to finish graduate school, I started looking at uh, my, my first preference would have been go to go to Beaverton, Oregon and work for Tektronics. But I noticed some, uh, some recruiting flyers in, in the, the uh, recruiting office at Arizona State and they had Texas Instruments and IBM and they were in Austin. I said, well, I kind of like Austin. So. <laughs> So I signed up to interview with TI and IBM, and I never heard from Tektronix, or actually I heard after I had already accepted it and, and moved. <laughs> so they were a little bit you know, slow in the uptake. Yeah. Um, I interviewed a few other companies, but well, the major one was uh, Sperry Flight Systems in mm -hmm. Phoenix, and by that time I was uh, kind of burned out on the, the hot weather and, and just the climate, so. Um, I got to go up. I, I got to go up in some some of their corporate jets. So they were really trying to. I, I, I was under wow. a uh, basically a fellowship from various flight systems. So oh. they tried their best, but I just wasn't wasn't interested in the area anymore. Yeah. So you took a job in Austin, Texas, right. with IBM, or I took it with IBM. Yeah. I, I actually um, I liked the job with tech, I liked the job description of what Texas Instruments offered me. Mm -hmm because it was working on something that I think they called it, it's like the TI 9900, it's been so long. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I was really impressed because they had multiple registers, uh, stored in memory by the way, which is not where you want registers. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I thought that was really a cool idea. Fast task, task right. switching was possible because yeah. you just point, you have a pointer. It, it, in theory, but the registers were in memory. So, so it's, it's slow. So it's slow. So um, in my interview at IBM had to do with, with um, power transistors and how you activate solenoids and what happens you know, basically when you release a solenoid you get the flyback and voltage and how do you handle that because at the time they did mag card typewriters and, and selectrics it mm -hmm. was an office products division mm -hmm. but they offered me a lot more money than texas <laughs> instruments <laughs> and at the time i didn't have a, you know it was go with the flow so i, I joined ibm um, and when i moved i i had this old uh, Nissan truck at the time it was Datsun and it had this problem with the uh, the oil filter basically the gasket would blow and it, mm. y you got to the point where you, you you could hear the sound and you knew what was happening so you turn off the motor and reset, <laughs> reset the oil filter it would just loosen up it, it the gasket would actually blow out and mm. it would start squirting oil right? so th there's a reason I told you that because in San Antonio I stayed with some friends and I went up to Austin uh, with another friend in another car and uh, went to go apartment hunting and I wasn't supposed to join IBM for like a month or two. I was going to take a, take a breather and just hang out in San Antonio. But I lent my truck to one of my other, one of my friends there who wanted to pick up a mattress and so he didn't know about this oil filter problem and he was cruising down the I -4, Loop 410 in San Antonio at about 60 miles an hour and drained, <laughs> to drain the oil out of the truck and the engine seized up so here I am you know in between jobs with no transportation and I called up IBM and I said hey can I you know I got this problem <laughs> I need to, I need to buy a car can I start working there you know like tomorrow and they they said sure but they changed whatever job they had in mind for me and they put me in the uh, 801 group or what became the the, the ROP group right. the 81 microprocessor group so I was the first member in that group because they, they shuffled sort of people around and, and they opened up, they had this opening that they created for me so I could join early. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea what I was gonna end up working on, but that was how I got into processors. 
Wow, so that's real serendipitous. Y yeah, well, there's going to be a lot of that to come. <laughs> <laughs> so you were the, technically the first member of the 801 team? Yes. Wow. But, it, it, okay, so let me be specific. There, there was an existing 801 project right. in uh, IBM Research, in, uh, in uh, T.J. Watson Research. Research um, <clears throat> but they were doing, um, I think it was, an e it was ECO based, mm -hmm. it, basically a mini computer. So it was, you know, mainframe sized, you know, lots of large uh, motherboard types of uh, circuitry. Okay. And what I was the first was a, what became the, the uh, office products division mini processor, which, which was supposed to go into things like the display writer, you know, early office processing mm -hmm. equ equipment. So, so the 801 existed as a mini computer. We, we were planning to, to spin it as a, a NMOS based microprocessor. Okay, so it was going to be, uh, instead of discrete, uh, ECL was going to be integrated into one chip. In uh, one NMOS, NMOS, NMOS chip. And 801 referred to the building? Building 801. In, is that the one in New York or is that in Austin? It's in New York. It's the, so that's the original New York building? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the main, their main research building there is building 801. Okay. Cool, so then the team started forming and you were the first member of that team doing the NMOS chip. Right. And then, so how did that, how did that develop? Well, we, we spent a year, um, it's actually kind of interesting looking back at it, because once IBM decided they were going to do this chip, I, I was the first member of the design team, but there were other architecture teams at, mm -hmm. at the time. So th there were quite a few people giving input to the design, and, and at the time, maybe two or three designers, like Phil Hester is a name mm -hmm. um, that, that's a, a reference. Um, so I had this kind of funny experience as a, as a new grad in, in my first year uh, with a, a lot of, I didn't know at the time, heavyweight <laughs> IBM architect types yeah. um, coming to Austin because they're going to help architect this ship. So, so before I even knew who he was, I got to meet uh, John Cock. In fact, my manager called me into his office, my manager's office once. And here's this old guy holding a cigarette with about <laughs> an inch and a half of ash. He was trying to keep it from falling on the floor. <laughs> and he starts asking me questions about, you know, how I would go about doing certain things. You know, and I, I figured, you know, people were always, in IBM, there was always somebody coming by to poke at what you're doing. So mm -hmm. I gave him kind of a flippant answer. You know, I don't, I, I, I vaguely remember what it was about, but it had to do with um, some kind of uh, bus error signal and how you might implement it. Um, so I only later found out who I was kind of, you know, treating flippantly. <laughs> um, but we used to have these meetings with 20 or 30 people sitting around a conference room, you know, half of them smoking, all of them yelling at each, at each other. And the, I mean, that, that's a bizarre experience to begin with. And, yeah. and the, the other thing that I always thought was funny was, you know, anytime I raised an argument, they would take me seriously. And, you know, they would argue with me, even though I, you know, at the time basically had no idea what I was talking about. Yeah. But it was but a it was new a, area. So. Yeah, it was, a, it was a good experience. It was a good experience getting exposed to that sort of uh, personality, I guess, even though yeah. um, I, I, you don't see much of that, you know, chain smoking around the conference room and screaming anymore. No, chain smoking is pretty much gone. Yeah. You have to go outside to do your chain smoking. Yeah. And it, it, even cigars, it was like cigars, pipes, cigarettes, you just, uh, it's kind of funny thinking back on it. Different era. Different era. So how, how did the, that program develop and, and your involvement and how long did you last? Oh, pretty much, uh, I would say starting the second year until I left eight years total into it. Yeah. So, well, IBM had this, um, I, I guess they considered it a rigorous culture. Okay, so, so you develop the architecture and then we built what's called a functional equivalent model. So, so it was, was implemented in TTL, and it was functionally equivalent. Um, so it was these boards about like this, and it was six of them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it wasn't equivalent to the chip design, but it, was, it met the architectural spec. Mm -hmm. So we built a couple of those, I think, and I ended up with the job of, you know, somebody wants to do the ALU, right? Somebody wants to do the, the bus. <laughs> And then there's all this other stuff, right, th to make it all work together. Yeah. 
So I ended up being the kind of the glue to make sure that this unit talked to that unit, talked to this unit, talked to that unit, and I wrote all the microcode for the thing. It was a risk machine, but it was still microcoded, and it, it, it was mostly one instruction per one microcode instruction. Right. But it also had, had like the interrupt handling routines were written in microcode. Oh, okay. Uh, exception handling, because uh, IBM was very big into this, what they called RAS, which is reliability, availability, and serviceability. So it wasn't just execute instructions, it was all this other infrastructure to you know, detect errors and try to figure out what, what was causing them. Mm -hmm. So they so, had to check architecture and all that stuff. Yeah, uh, for example, one of the things that it did was um, when it powered up, it would, it would send a signal on each pin and feed back through the pin into the receiver and make sure that the buses, buses had integrity, for example, okay. and report an error if, if there was a problem. That, that all ran on microcode? That was all run in microcode, yeah. Oh, so not state machines, you used microcode instead? Yeah. yeah. And it, it actually found, it, 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 when I first was required to do it, I thought it was kind of you know silly thing to do, but it, it actually did find errors. So, it, it, and when it found them, it, you knew what they were instead of you know running for who knows how long, so. Mm -hmm. Good, no deterministic error checking. So you said um, you spent what, roughly eight years at IBM? Yeah. And, and well, followed we, we, the 801 project through to? Yeah, we, well, I, I just mentioned the functional model. Yeah. The next thing we had to do was a nodal equivalent model. Okay. Okay, so that means that every, every gate in, in the final chip had a representation in TTL. Okay, so, so we, we would develop the netlist for the, for the chip and then transform that netlist into, you know, NAN, these quad NAN NOR, you know, flop. Uh, implementations. So this thing was was 18 AUGAT cord uh, AUGAT boards with 384 modules. I mean, these yeah. things were giant. Giants. AUGATs are, are big boards with wire wrap pins in the back. Wire wrap. Boy, do I remember the wire. <laughs> yeah. Did you have to learn to wire wrap? <laughs> yeah, and I had to deal with all the. It's a long story, but yeah. basically, one of the engineers on the on the team thought IBM technology was was second rate to you know, things that were available with third parties. So he didn't want us to use, he was kind of a senior guy that joined later. He didn't want us to use the IBM wire wrap wire, which was Teflon coated. It, it was actually really nice stuff. We yeah. used third party stuff. And it would, when it went around a, a pin, it would nick in short. And I don't know how many hours I spent. It, it, it wouldn't necessarily short, it would just kind of short, right? Oh, yeah. And, uh, but anyway. I, I ended up being chained to that thing for probably a year, year and a half, because I was, since I knew how everything worked, guess who gets to debug it, right? <laughs> you know, well, the ALU adds, <laughs> and, the, and the bus sends and receives things. Well, that's, yeah. it's a good learning experience, though. Oh, right? yeah. Well, the, for, the for, nice thing about it is I got, got to, I had already had the NMOS experience and <clears throat> the TTL experience. I had to do some, some uh, bipolar gate arrays in this process and all the clock distribution and you know you can imagine clock skew across 18 boards is fairly interesting to manage sure uh, so i did all the clock distribution in ecl so i got exposed to, to you know, ecl design so mm -hmm. you know by the time i left i had designed in just about every technology except cmos which of <laughs> course became the thing that you designed in yeah but in that era, the CMOS was still considered slow and... Oh, it was it, it was very slow. It was basically just coming on. A actually, yeah. NMOS at the time was significantly faster than yeah. CMOS, yeah. Uh, which is involved in how I left, but th that'll come. Oh, okay. <laughs> so tell us more. Uh, well, so the, the last few years, um, you know, we had done this processor and I had done a lot of the verification. It, it, it actually eventually did go into the PCRT Mm -hmm. um, but I got kind of, you know, frustrated with the slowness of, of IBM and we were doing the PC, what, what became the PCRT design and the people designing the memory controller wanted to implement it in CMOS. Okay, so we had a, we had a six megahertz processor. I, you know, it was a six megahertz 32-bit processor, yeah. which may sound slow, but at the time, this was 1983 or so. Uh, was was actually significant because at the time the state of the art was I don't remember the frequency but you know eight bit eighty eighty eight type stuff from Intel. Mm -hmm. um, so the group doing the memory design <laughs> or the memory uh, interface design 
wanted to use a, a CMOS uh, ASIC effectively, and it would only run at four megahertz. Okay, so I, I know four and six sound small, yeah. but six is 50% faster than, That's true. than four. So, I, so through the, some you know, interesting politics, I commandeered the design and used a combination of, of um, bipolar gate arrays and some uh, TTL clocking and got the design up to six megahertz. But the memory interface group uh, kept control of the memory card spec. You know, at the time it was card on board type of packaging. Okay. So, so I was doing the processor memory controller and other people were doing the MMU. And the interface of the memory card came, came out on my stuff and the specs started changing. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so I had committed up to the lab director that I would meet six megahertz, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, the rastacast delays and those sorts of things. I don't remember all the terminology, but it, 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 I met it, then it changed, and I met it, and it changed, and I met it, and it changed. Uh -huh. And I finally said, you know, I want to go somewhere else. So I went to IBM Research. And mm -hmm. uh, in the process of that, I, I was basically sitting, sitting in my living room one um, late Sunday morning, and I happened to pull down one of my DSP textbooks. And I hadn't looked at DSP in eight years. And I, I looked at this book and I said, you know, gee, I, I need to do something else <laughs> besides <laughs> what I'm doing because I'm, I'm, I'm really working hard, but it's, you know, it's just you're fighting the politics. Yeah. And it, it turned out it was going to be another two or three years before the system actually shipped. You know? yeah. And everybody else was starting to do workstations based on 6800s mm -hmm. and 68000s. And um, we were supposed to go into the original IBM PC, but they picked the 8088, and right. of course, you know, basically enabled Intel. And so all that just, as I was looking at this book, I said, I don't remember anything about DSP. I need to go back to, I need to go back and get my PhD so I can learn more. Yeah. And so, so I asked to be transferred up to the IBM Research Center just to get exposure to the, you know, basically the academic community. Mm -hmm. and, and the uh, Research Center up in New York? Yes, in Hudson so Valley. Well, in building eight hundred one yeah. is actually where I work. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there, I got contacts to uh, academic contacts to MIT and Berkeley and Stanford and a few other places. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, IBM had this uh, graduate fellow program, which was really a great deal. They they would move you to the to the area. Uh, pay your salary and pay your uh, pay you to go to school effectively, almost mm -hmm. regardless of how long it took. Uh, you know, as I said, a really sweet deal. So I, that's what yeah. I was originally planning to do. Um, but <laughs> to, to make a long story short, while I was there, one of the people that I dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis was a Stanford grad who had gone to Stanford with Paul Chu, hmm. and who's at AMD. So Paul Chu called him to ask if he knew anybody who had a, a risk processor background. I'll get into why when we get into 29K. Sure. <laughs> so so I, I come back, I, I, I moved back to Austin because the, the, the deal with uh, IBM Research was temporary. Yeah. And um, basically was you know, in a mood to leave. And in fact, some of the people I talked to at, at IBM Research had counseled me to leave. And at the time, nobody left IBM. You know, you joined yeah. and you so, retired right. and you got a pension. Job right. for life. So, um, just basically the frustration built up. You know, the visibility of what I was working on grew and grew, but my, my sort of visibility as part of it was getting less and less. So, um, IBM did me a favor and installed a, an answering machine in my office. And so Paul Chu called and left a, 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 a message on my answering machine. In a, it's kind of a long story, but you know, I, I came back to the office very frustrated because of a situation. Um, they were having a big demo for a bunch of managers, you know, and executives, mm -hmm. and told me I couldn't participate, but I should wear a suit in case something went wrong. <laughs> so, 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 so I came back, you know, spitting yeah. nickels, spitting you, you couldn't nails. participate. Couldn't participate, but if something broke, they wanted you to go in there and fix it. Yeah, you can't stand by it and explain how it works, but it might, it might break while our golden boy is <laughs> explaining. Yeah. Uh, so I came back and I turned on the answering machine, you know, this is Paul Chu, and, it, and I sort of like knew right away, you know, I'm leaving, I'm leaving uh, IBM and going to AMD. Yeah, so, so it's like that, that moment, it just like struck you like, 
Right. This, this is it. I, I got to make a change. Yeah. So, so I, I still had my applications out to, to uh, MIT and Berkeley and Stanford. Mm -hmm. And I, I left IBM, which is kind of an inter interesting experience. They won't let you, uh, when they are convinced you leave, you're leaving, right, you'll get the, you know, about an hour or two, you know, meeting a su succession of, of managers who will give you, you know, you know, if you want more pay, we'll give you more pay types of stuff. And after you've turned them all down, your manager comes and walks you out the loading dock because they, <laughs> they don't want, they don't want, to see anybody to see you being let out the front door, right? Yeah. So they take out yeah, the back, back door. Uh, and I couldn't go back in the building after that. Oh, really? <laughs> they, they walked you out and that was it. Yeah. You were you're done. Yeah. So, um, so we were supposed to move. This was right after uh, Christmas. Uh, we were supposed to move. I, I left, I think, January 3rd. And my wife was all antsy about moving to California and so forth. So. So we had a long discussion, and I said, "Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go out by myself and you know f figure out how things are, and you know we'll we'll move later." And r right after we decided that, the moving van pulled up, and we had actually canceled it, but somehow the message didn't get to the, <laughs> to, the oh, to the van company. <laughs> um, so we said, "Okay, we'll move." <laughs> you know, what, <laughs> what the heck? Um, so we moved out and stayed in in uh, as. Relocating, stayed in quarters here in, in the Bay Area, and I still remember. You know, I, one day I got a letter from Berkeley and a letter from Stanford, and I opened the one from Berkeley. Oh, we regret to inform you, and I said, "Gee, if I didn't get into Berkeley, I'm for sure not going to get into Stanford." And I opened the one from Stanford. as congratulations, and it was copied to the IBM, you know, IBM uh, fellowship coordinator or whatever. Right. And uh, I said, "Well, this is interesting. I've been accepted to Stanford." I have a new job. I have kids one and three. Uh, I don't have a house. I still have my house in Texas, uh, but sure, I'll go to I'll go to graduate school. So uh, that's how I ended up going to. Uh, I didn't actually join in. This was January. I didn't join in or didn't actually start Stanford until the fall. But you uh, but you'd accepted a job at AMD. Yes. And they were uh, agreeable to you going to Stanford to get your PhD? Yeah, and in fact, they paid the tuition. Okay. So that you already, that already, you already negotiated that with Paul Chu and, and uh, AMD by that point in time? Um, after the fact, yeah. Oh, they, were, they were pretty open to it. Okay. It, and it actually, you know, somebody, I think I actually wrote this in the preface of the book or something, somebody said, said, said you know, never ever have a family go to graduate school and work full time. But that was what I was doing, plus carrying two houses um, in the end, because <laughs> I couldn't sell the one in Texas, and the one here cost uh, about eight times what, <laughs> what the one in Texas was, was worth. So, wow. um, But the good thing is, yes, I was working full time. I was actually traveling, you know, doing marketing pictures, or with marketing, doing pitches. Mm -hmm. um, but the Stanford experience was very synergistic with, with what I was doing at, at um, AM, AMD. So it was, in, in, in a sense, two full-time jobs, but there was a lot of overlap. So I was able to, to, to use knowledge, actually knowledge and you know, getting to know people and things like that. Okay. So who, who's your advisor at uh, Stanford? Uh, Mark Horowitz. Okay. So I assume you are doing your research at Stanford revolved around risk processor design and... and uh, well, I, I, I had already had a lot of experience with processor design. I, right. I wanted to, to learn more about the systems aspects. Okay. aspects. So operating systems, compilers, um, more basic exposure to semiconductor technology and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, I really didn't need the design. I, I had done so much design at IBM that, that I was pretty comfortable with my knowledge there. And it was more the related fields like, uh, like I said, circuits, compilers, uh, right. operating systems, programming languages, and those sorts of things. Okay, so the kind of the gestalt of the, the whole. Yeah. Thing. So, uh, but meanwhile, you had accepted a job at AMD. So let's, well, let's talk a little bit about that, that experience. So you talked to Paul Chu and, and who other else, and then what was, the, did, was that the 29,000 program, or yes. was that before? Well, it's what became the 29,000. Okay. At the time, it was called uh, SIP, which stands for Streamlined Instruction Processor. Mm -hmm. um, and the 
the objective was, I, I know there's a lot of confusions in, you mentioned earlier about the 29K, uh, about what we were trying to accomplish, mm -hmm. but what I was given to believe we were trying to accomplish and what we were focused on was to, to continue a progression of, of AMD's, you know, what originated as bit slice products. Right. Which are you know little four bit funk, four bit slices of you know ALUs and registers and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. building blocks. Oh, no, building blocks, and but those building blocks have been replaced by what they call functional slices, mm -hmm. which are you know thirty two bit data paths. Right, the twenty nine C three hundred family. That, or bi the CMOS version was a right. bipolar version. Right, three twenty three. Yeah, that's another funny story. At product planning at, t at AMD at the time, you get up and present a, a product concept, and there was two two groups. The, the bipolar group and the CMOS group. And the first thing question, was this bipolar or is this CMOS? And it's like, <laughs> there were other questions besides, you know, what technology it's implemented in. Well, the, but, but that was actually, because AMD was a manufacturing company. Yeah. Uh, that was actually important. That was an important thing. I mean, uh, what was a bipolar or CMOS? AMD went for a period of time when bipolar was their primary uh, solution to a lot of problems and then switched to CMOS eventually. Right. And then MOS is in one way too. Right, it was just interesting to me that that was the, the aspect that was most important to the product. Yeah, well the, the, the bit slice products were, were started in bipolar. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and the, the early functional slice were bipolar also. Yeah. <clears throat> so th th these were, were, were nice parts. I'd actually used bit slice, slice parts in this, uh, this functional equivalent model that I mentioned yeah. at, at IBM. I, I'd been exposed to AMD. Uh, kind of another funny story. When when AMD first moved to Austin, I was still at IBM, and they used to advertise on the radio, you know, about you know great job opportunities at AMD. And I used to think, gee, you know, I'd really like to to work for AMD because I'm really impressed with these bit slice products. But they'd never hire somebody like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just the concept of working in a company like that for some reason. You know, I th I thought they were, you know, up here, and I was, you know, you know, just basically designing in TTL type stuff. Yeah. Um, but anyway, back to the, the objective of the 29K, they, okay. they wanted the flexibility that you got from the functional slice and the bit slice, but they wanted it to be a target for a C compiler mm -hmm. because the big problem people had it was it, that it had to be effectively microprogrammed, which is what we had done at IBM. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's not, it's not a very efficient way to, to, to develop and maintain programs. Right. So our, our job was to define a, an efficient target for a C compiler, which is why most of the, most of the features in the 29K were there. It's, the risk, it was the risk philosophy in terms of uh, making it an efficient target, which is why we had so many registers and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, but there were other models. There was MIPS and there was Spark uh, the, that, were, that were still being developed at that period of time were available. Right. Uh, as, as models, uh, right. did you did you look at those architectures as well? Did well, MIPS was actually very similar to what I had done at, yeah. at IBM. In mm -hmm. fact, some claim that that maybe I should, this is a little out of school, but <laughs> some people claim that 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 you know the, the MIPS idea ha was basically a derivative of some you know interaction with with uh, IBM research. Okay. Which is which is actually one of the things IBM research did at the time was yeah. was kind of get you know universities involved in, you know, things that they thought the universities ought to be involved in, yeah. so. Um, so the, the concept of the 20K was, but somewhat oh, similar, oh, yeah, how, I, how I, that I, was, I knew I had a, something I wanted to circle back to, and I was trying yeah. to remember. Um, we did look at those architectures, but the, the reason that the, okay, so we, we knew about Spark, we knew about MIPS, but the, the register file for the 29K actually has this, this property that it reduces the, the, the frequency of external loads and stores mm -hmm. by a significant amount, which for the embedded market, we were thinking that most of the interface would be to things like DRAM. So you know, both Spark and MIPS assumed you know, external caches and you know, load, the load latency wasn't a big deal. Right. The, the 29K stack cache is, is kind of a, you know, let's say it's a very rudimentary cache. It actually caches a fair amount of the activity that, that you would see to the L1 caches. Mm -hmm. 
So it wasn't, it wasn't just something we, we did to do it. There was actually a, a reasoning behind it. Mm -hmm. And it had advantages against Spark because the, the windows weren't fixed. They were actually variable. And this, this is a, something that a lot of people miss, mm -hmm. that, that you only allocated the amount that you needed. And, and you could basically manage it purely like a stack. Mm -hmm. And with respect to MIPS, you know, MIPS is basically you know, spilling and filling a fixed number of registers because of right. the, the, the procedure linkage calling convention. Mm -hmm. But you had a total of, uh, I think, 192 registers, if I remember yeah. correctly, which was a very large amount of registers for that time, 32 yeah. bit, full 32-bit registers. Yeah. So that had to take up a, a fair amount of die area. So that, was that, that, that had to be a, an interesting trade-off when you said, how much die area are you going to allocate to register file compared to other, other functions in the, in the part? Yeah, it was actually, um, the die was about a quarter registers, about a quarter functional units, about a quarter uh, the branch target cache, which mm -hmm. is something we haven't talked about yet. Yeah. Uh, and about a quarter MMU. Mm -hmm. And all of those were designed, it, 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 the, the register file may have been, let's say the, the most robust with respect to what other people were doing. Yeah. But the, in the other areas like the branch target cache, it had the same philosophy, it was, it was caching as much as you could on chip and being as effective as you could with that on chip cache mm -hmm. uh, without uh, requiring the expense of, of an off chip cache because we were expecting you know, de effectively a DRAM design for the external memory. <coughs> and the so memory management unit was, was software reloaded, which, which MIPS had a similar type of concept, uh, mainly because you know, from a flexibility standpoint, you didn't want to force customers to have a, a specific page table architecture. Um, at, at, at the time, there were a lot of different alternatives to, to the page table architecture. Mm -hmm. And also, it, MMUs, in a lot of people's experience, and I'm not sure why this is, like the, the, the Motorola 68000 had, had, had real issues with, with managing the, the die growth of the MMU and the complexity and verification. Uh, so the only way, we had a lot of 68,000 people on the, on the design team. Effectively, the only way we could get them to implement an MMU is to say, well, it's not nearly as complex as what you're, mm -hmm. you're used to seeing. <clears throat> but it was still effect, I, I think it was effective. Mm -hmm. um, well, an embedded uh, MMU may not be as important because you, uh, um, at that time, uh, a lot of, uh, Embed a code was you know not paged or uh, the, right the main the main issue was memory protection not yeah. not demand paging yeah in fact I doubt anybody ever did a demand page uh, structure but it was definitely used in in the embedded uh, for memory in the embedded applications for memory protection yeah I, if you wanted to run the Unix on top of it you would have then done demand paging right but they never got it. so it's interesting because there was a disconnect with. Um, certain up management, and, and I think specifically, uh, I, I can remember a poster and it talked about, you know, 20K, the next platform. So right. there was some disconnect between the engineering group and your vision, and, and er, that, that clearly was the way things were going, was this is an embedded processor. But there were some people in upper management and thought this was the next Unix platform that AMD was gonna develop. I, I think it's maybe a more, somewhat more complicated than that. I only discovered this after the fact, to, to be honest. It, it, at the time, AMD was having a lot of issues with Intel, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it, when when IBM picked Intel, they they forced Intel to pick a second source. The, first of all, they they gave Intel a lot of capital. You know, it's kind of insurance. Yeah. And they made them enable you know, a, 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 another party to be able to build uh, 8088s to start. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I suspect that Intel picked AMD thinking they would never you know, cause them any trouble effectively. Because mm -hmm. as you said, they were a bipolar company that just, they, they, and at the time they, they were doing uh, Zilog processors and, and other, other uh, licensed types of products and right. would not be an obvious competitor to Intel. Mm -hmm. But AMD actually was very aggressive and, and did, a, did a pretty good job uh, beating the Intel to market in some cases. So Intel was starting to, to push them away, and I, I think AMD management saw the 29K as, as something they could position against 
uh, you know, let's say might replace eight, you know the x86 at some point. Yeah, I, I was never part of those discussions, and as I said, I only found out through through the grapevine, so to speak, after the fact. Yeah. And it, it, if that's what we were trying to do, we weren't designing the right part. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, it, it, so it, it never th that that thought that pla that platform architecture never influenced the design on the twenty nine thousand. Uh, no, it, it, well it. Um, it, for a period of time, we did um, we did a an off chip cache part that I never really quite understood why we were doing it, uh, and it, it wasn't it wasn't instigated by me. I, mm -hmm. I did it. I, I worked with some other engineers to define it, but I never quite understood what we were doing, why we were doing it, and it, later on, I suspect, it's, I, based on what I found out later on, I suspect. That it had to do with wanting to position against um, yeah. Intel, but you know, the thing is, there were a lot of people doing, you know, computer type products or platform type products. Yeah. I mean, you know, engineering workstations were the big thing. Personal right. computers were everywhere. You know, why would why would you be you know one of five or six people doing uh, doing an, yet, yet another computer when when the embedded market had had some significant performance requirements? But they couldn't afford all the all the the cost of a, of a you know computing platform. Yeah, yeah I, I think that worked out really well because the twenty nine thousand was a nat became a successor to the twenty nine hundred bit slice and the twenty nine uh, three hundred family of, of uh, horizontal slices, um, and a lot of that customer base went to the twenty nine thousand eventually, and uh, it became a good embedded product. And um, platform wise, it, it would have been swallowed up trying to compete with MIPS, Spark, Power. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the others. Cool. So, uh, tell me a little bit about the early twenty nine thousand team. Who's who's on it? Oh, uh, Brian Case, Smita Gupta, uh, Tim Olson, Phil Frieden, mm -hmm. uh, Dave Sorensen. I hope I haven't left anybody out. Yeah. But <laughs> well, we could always I add the list. That's about it. Yeah. yeah, I didn't realize Sorensen was on the team because he he's a field application engineer. He, he was. I'm talking about the the very initial yeah, early yeah. team. He yeah. he he did. Uh, oh, Rod Fleck was another. Rod Fleck. Yeah. Uh, both Dave and Rod left. Did I mention Brian Case? I yes, called. you did. Okay, so um, they all left pretty much after after the spec was done, and went went to do other things. Yeah, and Tim Olson didn't stay too late either, did he? he oh no, he he stayed. Oh, he didn't stay through the whole thing. He, you know, he, he, he moved. He moved to Austin. When, right. the, when the team moved to Austin in '89, okay. yeah, but he was there. I don't know. I would guess maybe '94, '95. Okay, so he just stayed quite a long time. Yeah. And um, so um, this project started developing. You had some lead architecture, and then you uh, you started going to implementation. Uh, you start you st the, most of that works. Uh, it was in Austin, Texas, correct? The whole team. Most of the implement. All of the implementation was in Austin, Texas. Okay. In the architecture, product planning, wh what we mm. called product planning, was in yeah. uh, Sunnyvale. And then, um, how did how did you uh, map out the architecture the instruction set? Uh, you know, finalizing the size of the number of registers. Was that was that basically limited by die area? Or with the nine one ninety two sort of an unusual number? So it wasn't one twenty eight. It was it had some well, fixed we, registers we, plus. Some yeah, we wanted we wanted two fifty six, and so yeah. we hack we hacked where it was. More efficient to hack, which is they, they were organized as uh, global registers and local mm -hmm. registers, somewhat somewhat mapping to global variables and, and local variables in a stack. Yeah, and the the global registers weren't quite as useful as the local ones. So when it came time to whack, we worked the, the global registers. Yeah. So and you whacked them just for was it for die reason or for die reason? Yeah. yeah. Did you have a target die size, and then you had to fit everything into it, or is it just you kind of grew, and then you figured, well, that's that's there was good enough. There, there was a target, but at the time it was very hard to predict where you were actually going to end up. Mm -hmm. So so it was accepted that things would grow somewhat, mm -hmm. and probably still is. I mean, it's yeah. it, there's so much going on that you can't really. It, there, there's so many variables that go into die size you can't really yeah. uh, necessarily predict where you're going to end up. Yeah. One of the truly unique parts of, of, of aspects of it was the branch target cache. Right. That was a that was a very cool idea. Can you explain a little bit behind it? Yeah. Um, it was originally an instruction cache, 
mm -hmm. and it it would it, a cache of sufficient size really wouldn't fit on the chip. And we were arguing among ourselves in one product planning meeting, and and I made the offhand comment that you know it's kind of a shame that that we have so much memory there because mostly what it does is is um, cover the, the the latency that fetch branch targets. And I, I you know, th that's as far as I took the idea. Mm -hmm. And Phil Frieden, you know, the next day said, said, well, if that's the only thing it's good for, why don't we just cache branch targets in the, in the cache? And he said, oh, yeah, I never thought of that. You know. yeah. So it, it was, it, once you see it, it's a very kind of cool and obvious idea. Yeah. But l a lot of cool ideas are, are obvious only after, <laughs> after you see them. Yeah. So functionally, if you had a, a branch, uh, rather than waiting, stalling, waiting for the, the DRAM to access, you had a short uh, four bytes, was it? Uh, four words? Four, four instructions. Four instructions that you could access for the beginning of the branch that you're taking while you wait for the, the warm up the DRAM to get right. access to the rest of it. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that, was, that was quite cool. So, you didn't need to, it, it, it gives you the, the low latency of a cache, um, but without the penalty of die area. With a much smaller uh, die overhead, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, because so, so as the 20,000 programs come together, uh, you know, the instruction set, was there anything unique about well, putting this instruction set together? Or it was, you know, three, uh, two source, des one destination, uh, uh, three so uh, two source, one destination architecture. Um, everything was register based, pretty classic uh, risk architecture. Yeah, the, the, at the time all risk instruction sets were, were 32 bits, mm -hmm. uh, except for what we had done at IBM. <laughs> that was actually a precursor to what came later in things like ARM with Thumb. Uh, at IBM, one of the big changes we made from the 801, the, the 801 was actually a 24-bit architecture of all things. Hmm. So when we moved to 32 bits, <clears throat> the, the office products group was very concerned about uh, memory, uh, what they called byte efficiency, which is how much you can encode, encode in uh, a certain set of instructions. So they insisted we have 16 and 32-bit instructions, but the rest of the world was doing only 32-bit instructions, and that's what we did with 29K. And when you have 32-bit instructions, that, that 32 is actually more bits than you really need, so that where most of these risks differentiated at the time was what they did with all the bits that they didn't need. <laughs> but there was, a, I can't think of anything in particular that was was unique about the instruction set. Mm -hmm. It was uh, fairly straightforward. I mean, like I said, standard risk instruction set. Uh, but the, the unique aspects were the large register files. So, you, I mean, in theory, you, could, you had uh, eight bits per register file address. Right, well, that's where we use the bits that you don't, that yeah. <laughs> that yeah. other people were wasting them on other things like predication and whatever. You know, we wasted them, on, if you want to call it wasting them, uh, register identifiers. Okay. Did, um, uh, was it, uh, uh, all, uh, was there any microcode in, in the 20K? Was it all no, no, state no. machine control? All state machine. Yeah. And then, so how did the, the chip development take place? You had the architecture put down. How did, uh, how did the chip itself progress? Um, well, it started in 85, and I, it took, I would say, about three years and maybe four revs till it was functional. I don't think there was anything. It wasn't unusually long or unusually short you know, for the time frame. Mm -hmm. It had some, it had some issues when it went into production. Um, basically, the branch. It's a very long story, but I guess I might as well tell it. <laughs> well, because it's kind of a funny story. Okay. Uh, basically, the branch target cache. There were two sets. Right. And, and if neither sets hit, it would, um, it would, tri-state both cache outputs. And the instruction buffer would would go metastable as a result. And metastability oh. means the latch basically chases its own tail. Yeah. And what uh, there was one the one symptom of this is it would would um, flip a bit in the stack pointer into the stack cache. Okay. So what would happen is we found this. We called it the Prem bug because there was a guy in, who had joined the team called Prem Sobel. Mm -hmm. He wrote this Towers of Hanoi program. And we ran it, and it, it, we never could get it to work. It would always crash. Ah. And the reason it would crash is that it's a very recursive program, 
and because of this meta stability, you get to a, a point and the stack would jump up by 4K locations and keep growing. Mm -hmm. And when it came back, it would find, you know, basically, you know, a bunch of junk on the stack and, and crash. Mm -hmm. And at around the time I was moving back to Austin, the whole team was tearing their hair out with, with that. We eventually actually did a, 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 part, a spin of the part with, without the stack cache called the 29005. Oh, wow. Um, but it, my recollection is it took us about nine months to figure out what was going on there. Yeah. Um, but other than that, it was, everything was fine. <laughs> yeah, well, aside from that one minor prop. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but what other unique things do you remember about the 29,000 program? Oh, um, traveling all over the country, talking to teams, which is something I'd never done at IBM. Mm -hmm. I was actually surprised that, that AMD would let me out of the house, so to speak, yeah. because at IBM, engineers never, ever talk to customers, at least not in any that I knew. Yeah. And at AMD, you know, it, it pretty much you had to go talk to customers, which yeah. is much better, in my opinion, but it was something that was just really struck me that you could go talk to, to you know, digital equipment and data general and, you know, at the time Wang and all these companies that, that you know, were, were famous and you could talk to famous people and, um, you know, effectively get to learn the industry just just by being an engineer you know, yeah. not, and not a salesperson or a marketer. Yeah, I, that, I mean, it was part of the, because Jerry Sanders was such a uh, sales-oriented executive and uh, the, the company itself had a very sales-oriented uh, culture mm -hmm. and, and drove everybody to be more more outward and more customer facing but yeah that, that was an interesting experience I didn't realize that that was that, that had uh, that had an impact on you oh yeah the um, so the 20,000 comes out it's pretty successful we, we there's a lot of design work going on um, and you have uh, we had to start working on the next generation part how did that uh, how did that develop well we we did I would estimate maybe four or five follow-on products. Right. So <clears throat> before the the K five days. So was this was before the K five yeah. days. So we um, the original twenty nine thousand bus because we had been poking at because we had been poking at Intel. And this is my read of the situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in, Intel will always position something against their competitors. Mm -hmm. okay. And so they won't, let, they, they won't let anybody, especially AMD, have a product that they don't have some kind of response to. So in the case of the 29,000, they, Intel picked the i960, mm -hmm. which, I mean, we don't need to go into the background, but it wasn't, it wasn't meant for what they were positioning it as, but mm -hmm. they had something to position. Right, and in fact, and they had also an 860, and, and they actually swapped their position. And a 432, and yeah. Intel has all kinds of things yeah. in, their, in their legacy. So, so Intel, you know, launched their, their marketing campaign against the 29,000 bus because it had three buses, mm -hmm. which is something we haven't talked about, but it was an, an oh, interesting. <laughs> At the time, it, other products had, you know, instruction, it, Harvard architecture, instruction yeah. address, data address, instruction memory, data memory. And we had one, one address bus for both, and then it was, was kind of a unified address and then split instruction and data. Mm -hmm. uh, so you get the effect of a Harvard architecture with uh, fewer pins effectively. Mm -hmm. And Intel, uh, other processors at the time just had, yeah. you know, multiplexed or demultiplexed address and they were all instructions or data. Right. Intel would go out and, and just hammer us with customers. And of course that would come up back through the sales force and they would yeah. hammer on my management <laughs> and say, you know, man, you really screwed up, didn't you? And at the at the time, the 29K was actually the, the, the highest instructions per second per square millimeter of silicon. I mean, it was absolutely the most efficient design at the mm -hmm. time. Yeah. But the, the reason for that was the bus architecture and, and the, the stack cache and the, the branch target cache. Right. And, and so everybody started just, just whining effectively that we had a we had a crappy bus architecture, if I can use that word. You well, can edit it, out. It, 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 <laughs> it did it did it did require more complexity in the board design, right? Because you had a, but you there had was a multiplex it, address bus, you had a demultiplex. The issue is how what yeah. do you, what do you, you get, get for benefit. that complexity, right? right. It's 
Oh, but anyway. for embedded designs, typically in that day, you had separate instruction and data uh, buses and, and, and memories. Right. So in, anyway, the, the point is we, we ended up doing a product that, that grew the caches only because we had a, a more advanced process technology. So we had, um, initially we, we put on a real instruction cache, if you will, mm -hmm. and that allowed us to, to remove the, the split instruction data bus. And we cleaned up a few protocol things, and that became the 29030. Mm -hmm. um, we are also had started to become fairly successful in the laser printer market. So we did, did a, a, a series of chips that were, were I would say, initial, what, what would have become SOCs because we had the processors plus uh, peripheral logic, where the peripheral mm -hmm. logic was, was dedicated to uh, laser printers. Mm -hmm. And we had three different versions of that, you know, kind of a low, middle, mid range, and high end. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, we tried to do a super scalar product, uh, but that never really, uh, that, that eventually got, I would say, de-emphasized in favor of, of uh, an x86 design using the same concepts. Yeah. Uh, but you missed uh, 29050, which had the floating point unit. Oh, right, yeah. Um, that, that was actually done very close to the 29,000, and I didn't do that. I was, I was at... I was doing my, finishing my PhD at, at Stanford. Okay, so, so. The 20, the, after 20,000 was done, there was a, a, a different development that you didn't, because yeah. they took the, the 29 uh, C327 floating point core, as I understood right. it. And the, 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 the lead architect for that was Bob Perlman, and he okay. actually led the 29050. I, I didn't mean to omit that, I, I thought you were asking about yeah, I know. things that I worked on, and well, I, I don't consider that to be, okay. it, you know. Yeah. It, it, it wasn't a part that I would take you know, direct responsibility for. It was a fine part. Yeah. In fact, it's in, still in lots of 777s as far as I understand, uh, in the avionics. Uh, yeah. That, uh, that's wasn't, wasn't why I didn't mention it. It's right. just that I, I was off trying to finish my, my research. Oh, well, that's, yeah, I guess that, but that's a, a clarification in the 20th. I didn't realize that you had no involvement on the 050. That was different. Very little. I, w yeah. I, was, I would spend maybe two days a week at AMD uh, arguing with people <laughs> about w what we should be doing, but um, other than that, it was it was really more an advisor. Okay. Um, so you so you finish up your P you finish up your PhD at at, at Stanford, um, and where does the the blue book come into play? Is this, this is post your PhD or while you're doing your PhD? Uh, I wrote book. the book afterwards, yeah. but the, um, it's, ba it's based on the research that okay. I did for the PhD. Oh, so what you get to the, ti the title of the book was? Superscalar Processor Design. Yeah, I oh, wanted to get it out there. <laughs> um, and interestingly enough, at the very tail end of that book, you posit the idea that you could do an x86 with a RISC core. Right. And, and that actually, just sort of like, just almost like a throwaway at the end of the book. You talk about all the stuff and then it's sort of in there. It, 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 it was a throwaway. Yeah. The, the, basically the, that wasn't part of the original plan. It was put in there for, let's call, call it marketing reasons. Mm -hmm. Basically more people would read the book if it had <laughs> some mention of the x86. Really? Um, yeah, really. Um, so I, I had to actually dig down, get, you know, get the manuals, try to figure out how the x86 worked, and that, that was the first time I'd ever actually paid any attention to it, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. So, so um, well, actually, we'll, we'll, we'll jump to the K5 in a little bit, but is there anything we should wrap up on the 29,000 program, the 030? Mm, I think we've covered most of it. Most okay, of good. It. So, this little throwaway. Now, how did that, how did that then become the K5? Uh, or is it completely unrelated? It was the throwaway and then the K5 idea was completely separate. Uh, I would say it's completely separate. Okay. Because it, it seems like they were related, that you were talking about in the book, and then this K5 program takes off based on a similar concept. They, they had the same, the same topic, but they had nothing to do with each other. Okay. So how did the K5 program, how did you get involved in it? Um, and the K5 for, for uh, is, is the first clean room 
x86 processor AMD ever did with the, well, not clean room, because it was a bottoms up AMD designed x86 processor. Right. Well, at, at the time, the, okay, so Intel's doing reverse engineered x86 processors. It, it, after the 286, uh, the 386 and the 486, the agreement with Intel was that AMD would effectively, you know, get the designs, you know, and would be able to manufacture them. <clears throat> so they get the mass sets and, mm -hmm. and and run them through their process uh, fabrication facilities. Mm -hmm. But they were doing so much better <laughs> than than Intel that Intel got into the to the mode of just not cooperating by giving them the 386 and of course not the 486. Mm -hmm. So a AMD developed the strategy of re reverse engineering which was to have two design teams uh, taking pictures of of layouts and separately reverse uh, separately reverse engineering the circuits creating schematics and then then comparing the schematics to make sure that the, the they had then inferred the circuit structure correctly. Right. <clears throat> And of course, they realize it doesn't take much to realize that you can, you might do that with the 386, and they did, mm -hmm. and you might do it with the 486, and they did. Although there were, were a lot of issues related to it. Yeah. Uh, well, there was a big issue of the microcode because, as much as you get all the circuit design, the microcode has a lot of the special sauce built into right. it. Right. I I know I, I managed the, the microcode clean room. That's a little, maybe not a well-known <laughs> fact. Well, uh, it, yeah. it wasn't supposed to be known, but I guess the statute of limitations has, has run out. Yeah, I, I think AMD had, um, had a, a clean room version of the microcode in development in case they couldn't get rights to the Intel microcode. Right, and that, I, I was responsible for staffing that and, and managing uh, it and keeping them clean, so to speak, no. making sure nobody talked to them that shouldn't talk to them, <laughs> except for me. Um, so we started this discussion by, by you know, the situation that, that AMD was in mm -hmm. was they knew they needed to get out of this reverse engineering business. But at the time, uh, PowerPC had, had, had started. Uh, Alpha was claiming they were gonna, you know, they were gonna take over the world. And mm -hmm. MIPS was claiming they were gonna take over the world. And Spark was claiming they were gonna take over the world. So, so, so there were, all these companies doing risk processors, and you know we're going to beat Intel. You know there's no way they can keep up. Blah blah blah, and so AMD got into this to this indecisive mode where you know do do we do we continue on the x86 path somehow, or do we license an Alpha or license a MIPS or license a PowerPC, or or even just do an original implementation because some of those risk processors don't really have a lot of, of IP, IP protection to the uh, yeah. instruction sets. So that's where I, I started becoming involved in this. It, it wasn't, you know, go do an x86. It was help us answer this question. You know, right. you, you know we, we know you like risk, but we really want you to be honest about answering the question of uh, whether risk can beat x86. And at the time, of course, I was, had spent my whole career basically doing risk processors. Right. But the more I looked at the question, the more I realized that there's n nothing fundamental to x86 that says it can't keep up to some level of performance with the, the other processors. And at the same time, Intel had lots of capital to spend in, in process technology and circuit design. Mm -hmm. So architecturally, there was nothing they could do or not much they could do. But in terms of raw, you know, megahertz types of performance, there was plenty they could do. And it, it never seemed to me that there was going to be more than about a 30% advantage to risk. And these days, I'm not sure there's any at all. But mm -hmm. at the time, the, the, the standard was you had to have twice the performance to, to break Intel's monopoly. Right. And this, it, it was sort of funny because I, I was expected to be a risk proponent and I, I ended up actually arguing with, with AMD management that we shouldn't pursue <laughs> the risk path. Mm -hmm. if, if your problem is you know, personal computing, 
you ought to find a way to stick with x86. Yeah. So the problem is that that, you know, my research was finished in 1989, and because of this, this analysis paralysis, if you will, we we actually didn't decide to do anything uh, until '92. Mm-hmm. So so we lost. Uh, in retrospect, we lost three years you know, analyzing this problem. Huh. <clears throat> and at the time, Intel was taking about five or six years per generation. Um, up until up until the fifth generation, <clears throat> excuse me. And then starting at the starting at the fifth generation, they were reacting to the Power PC, which was IBM, Motorola, and, and um, Apple. Apple. And they were really concerned about PowerPC. They weren't that concerned about what what you know, Alpha might be or what MIPS might be. Yeah. And their response, as I said, was to was to invest loads of capital into shortening the development cycles, and 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 increasing the the frequency growth curve that right. their processors were on. And meanwhile, AMD was, you know, <laughs> do we do an original yeah. processor or not? Yeah. Right. So we started, it, once we did start, we had three years compared to what, what Intel's timelines were going to be. Yeah. Uh, not that we knew it. And AMD's process technology was, AMD was always, was always you know, short for capital. So we were partnering at that time with Hewlett Packard. Mm-hmm. So our process technology was, was three, lo- three levels of metal and no trench isolation and Really, a basic, very basic uh, process technology for the, the the problem that we were about to be faced with. We except that we didn't know we were going to be faced with it. Mm-hmm. Right? We used to mar- argue with marketing guys um, that the design shouldn't be more than sixty six megahertz. Um, it ought to have a four eighty six bus. It ought to have a unified cache. And if if you know anything about you know, a four issue superscalar <laughs> yeah. x86. You don't want to have a unified cache, no, trust me. Definitely not. But the 486 had it. So these are the levels of, yeah. of product planning discussions we're ha- we were having. So 486 bus, uh, we actually started with a 46 bus. We, we didn't have a unified cache. I, I actually yeah. won that argument. Um, but at the time, because AMD had been reverse engineering x86 products, a lot of the circuits that Intel had implemented were dynamic and had had um, lots of hazard conditions, and to to avoid to avoid any circuit reverse engineering problems, AMD had made all of their circuitry static, right? So so it, it ended up having the advantage that with AMD products you could stop the clock because they were static design. Mm-hmm. Intel, you stop the clock and you know, they'd blow up or something, right? Because <laughs> yeah. he, he, you end up with, with crowbar current and yeah. those kinds of things. So AMD ac- actually became pretty successful in the, in the early mobile market because you could stop the clocks on AMD products. Yeah. So we got the K5 and, and the emphasis was gonna be mobile. So it had to be 66 megahertz. And, and they actually liked the fact that it was, um, it, it, the K5 had a very High uh, IPC rate, even though it was a low clock, yeah. and it was that should be more efficient. It was more efficient, but you know, sort of, sort of, God help us. It was a, it was a four issue superscalar with a, with a five stage pipeline, <laughs> and, <laughs> and that thing wasn't going to run much faster than sixty six megahertz. Yeah, right? and but the, the trouble is, by the time it actually was approaching production. You know, first of all, we had we had eventually punted on on the the, the 486 bus and adopted a real Pentium bus. Yeah, uh, we made all kinds of changes to the to the cache architecture. And the Pentium bus was much more robust. It was a, a more, much wider than the 486 bus. Right. You had more bandwidth. Yeah. So, so I don't think there's an appreciation for the fact that okay, we had three years. We started with zero development infrastructure. Th- there was no spec for the part part. Mm-hmm. We, we effectively had to reverse engineer the spec. Yeah. Uh, there was no verification, you know, the way you do verification of original designs. Yeah. The verification was you know, two people taking photographs uh, and comparing the results. Um, and in those three years, we must, we must have, have restarted the, the spec 
in a major way at least twice. And we, we pretty much made the schedule or came very close to it, but our product was 66 megahertz. And, and at the, I, I'll, I'll never forget this because the same people arguing 66 megahertz, by the time the product was, was literally coming out the pipeline or the, the development pipeline, mm-hmm. oh, it's got to be 130. You know, Mike, you know, just go back and figure out. It, you, you, you see, there's this huge disconnect. Yeah. And I, I can't remember how many times I heard, well, look, the IPC is high. It's just the clock, <laughs> the clock is low. If you could make the clock high at that IPC, you know, it would solve all of the world's problems, which, it, which it would. But there, at that time, it, it, by that point, it's locked. You can't, you can't make that kind of a change. Right. And then coming from your background in the embedded side and, and what, what, you know, using what, you know, the 30% performance boost uh, per clock over, a, over the pandemic time so it was based on, largely on spec int, as I remember. It's, uh, you, you did a lot of benchmarking on using what was traditionally common benchmark. Right. Uh, but the PC market had adopted, you know, these PC benchmarks, which were completely it, it, different. It had adopted them right at, towards the tail end of, yeah. of our development. So yeah. the workstation world was using spec in. All of the, the, the benchmarking that everybody did at the time was based on spec in. Yeah, across we did, the we did We did fine on spec in. Yeah. But WinBench was based on Windows code. And, and I'll, I'll never forget some of these traces people started bringing me because Windows is built, it, it's built abstraction upon abstraction upon abstraction upon abstraction. And you'd see these traces basically push, call, push, call, push, call, push, call, push, call, push, call, add, <laughs> <laughs> return, pop, return, pop, return, pop, return, pop. And I go like, you're, you're kidding me, right? All, all you're doing in that kind of a code is you, you know, your, your instruction cache is just, just banging against itself because these procedure addresses have no relationship to each other, so there's no locality. Yeah. And our cache design wasn't, wasn't up to that, uh, that style of code, right? Mm-hmm. So we had, we had one more fix. A- a- actually, we were after, after we were in production with a, you know, a derated part, let's call it the SSA 75, I think was what, what it was called. Mm-hmm. Um, so we made what was called the big eye cache fix. <laughs> and I, I still, I don't remember the contents, but I still remember this you know, massive email that I wrote because everybody was saying, man, we just, you know, we don't know if this change is gonna work or if it's gonna meet the performance requirements. So I had to lay out, you know, in this, this long argument why it was going to be a very robust change. It, and it would take us, I think, six to nine months, but we could be guaranteed that we would meet this wind bench target yeah um, but the frequency was always an issue and there's really not much you can do about that yeah it's interesting that uh, the, the original positioning was that it could be a mobile part uh, because as I remember it, uh, it, it its power wound up actually because I think pushing the it was trying to push hard to get more frequency out of it so that one that push process wound up uh, uh, making it a little leakier and, and a little higher powering yeah it, it was supposed to be you know, fairly low frequency design. I think it was yeah. 20, 24 stages per clock. Yeah. Um, low frequency, but reasonable IPC at that low yeah. frequency. And, and static design, of course. Yeah. <clears throat> so, okay, so, but bottom line though was, uh, unfortunately, it, 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 it didn't meet marketing requirements compared to the Intel Spanium, which was uh, very, um, uh, App, well, I would say it was aptly, but it was also kind of uh, derivatively described to, at one, one session as two forty sixes bolted together, which is what it is. Yeah, yeah essentially, it, had, it was it was it wasn't a regular pipeline for each. I mean, it was an asymmetric pipeline between the two, but uh, it was it was two sys process cores uh, with a with a two issue instruction uh, dispatcher, basically what it was, and it had the wide bus so it could it could. Uh, penny bus, so it could take two, you know, multiple instructions in at a time. But it had the clock. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it was a that, deeper pipeline. That, that's why our marketing folks were reacting so strongly because Intel, you know, one thirty is better than sixty six, right? Yeah, and that's that's as the extent of it. And I'll still, re- one thing that amazed me is we had 
a product that ran at 90 megahertz. And it was only something like 3% slower than, in, than the Pentium at, at 130. Yeah. And the difference in price between theirs and ours was 320 some dollars mm -hmm. for 3% for performance yeah. because it had 130 and ours had 90 on it. Yeah. So there, there's a lot of money in, in you know, a, a three digit number, I guess. Yeah. Well, um, although from a die point of view, I, I think for a transistor count, um, K5 still had a higher transistor. Oh, count. yeah. It was that, more complex. I'm sure it did. Yeah. But did you know that Intel was simultaneously doing their own uh, internal risk processor that became the Pentium Pro? Uh, no. So you so we were, you were completely unaware that the Pentium Pro program, which basically was the same idea. It was a risk implementation internal, uh, well, with the x86 front end, uh, was being developed. And in fact, I. I had heard from a, co a couple people at Intel that the Blue Book was was in uh, was found in Oregon on a few prominent desks. Oh, I, I, I've heard that Intel engineers were, were required to read it. Yeah, <laughs> um, one of the reasons I wrote it is to is to, to to light fires under the the right managers at AMD, and unfortunately, it kind of backfired. I, I didn't. It, I, well, I, never expected, wanted I never expected Intel to pay much attention to it. Yeah, right. well, they did. Uh, so there was so you had no idea that there was a Pentium Pro program going on that was basically a risk internal core. Not not at that time, no. Yeah. So, which then eventually became the Pentium Two. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the K5, although fortunately, um, had these problems competing in the PC marketplace because of lower clock speed, uh, even though it had good IPC and all that. Um, but so that was hurting AMD's business prospects. So they had built that fab in Austin, Fab Twenty Five, and. Uh, the amount of K5 and and, uh, and the old 4A6 volumes weren't filling it, so um, they decided. Jerry decided to buy next gen. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have any any input on that, or did you know the next gen team at all? Had you talked to them because they were also doing a risk internal design as well? Right. I, I knew the team uh, professionally, but not. Yeah. Uh, I was kept out of that loop because of. You know, IP issues effectively. No, to, to isolate to. From yeah, I, I I read it in the paper. <laughs> really, <laughs> on, on a Saturday morning, wow. and you know they they were going at the t at the time I was on K seven, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. Yeah, and so I read in the newspaper. You know, AMD's acquired Next Gen, and Vin Dom, who had been at Intel and was at Next Gen, is is now taking over the K seven. So of course my phone's ringing all morning with you know, okay, Mike, what's going on? You're you're in charge of K7. I said beats me. You know. So what? Well, actually, <laughs> I'm did reading it. The, I'm reading it in the paper just the way you. Are. Well, what was the AMD version of a K6? Because you had K5, which then there should have been in, in, in theory it would have been a K6. Um, or was your K7 really K6 at the time? By our K7 was what what was coming after K5, and not not that we named them that. Uh, oh really? Right. So they skipped the K6 for some reason. Well, it was they didn't have those names. This, oh. it, these are all retroactive names. The the K5 was the only thing that was named. Right. We acquired Next Gen, called it the K6, K6. and called what I, we were working in Austin K7. Okay, so, so, so that K, was K, K6 and K7 were retroactive effectively, right. or or yeah. based on the fact that we already had a K5. So what was the case the K7 you were working on? What was the code name for that back then? Um, Argon. Was it Argon? Or Krypton. No, it was either Krypton. It, okay, Krypton was K5 and Argon was uh, okay. K7. And it, we originally, or Jerry Sanders wanted to, to name the K5 uh, Kryptonite, but Marvel Comics or whoever has the, <laughs> the, the copyright wouldn't let him use Kryptonite. Yeah. So. Uh, we had been calling it Taurus in Austin okay. uh, because all the reverse engineered products were named after uh, cattle. <laughs> so, so Taurus was going to be the cosmic bull. And so uh, all of our documentation was named Taurus. And okay. Jerry said, you know, call it kryptonite. So we changed it to kryptonite. And then they wouldn't let us use kryptonite, so we changed it to krypton in yeah. K7 because of noble gas yes, that yeah. we use argon. Okay. <laughs> No, did Jerry realize that calling it kryptonite was you're, you're you're taking down Batman? I mean, you're taking down Superman, so that was sort of like so that makes Intel the good guy. I don't think he, he didn't quite catch that. 
well, but the good guy, but still, still Superman. <laughs> yeah. So uh, when did you start on what was the K7 Ar uh, Argon? When did that start? It, as we were finishing K5, the a AMD insisted that I go on to the next generation, and K5 was transferred to, to another manager, which also kind of impacted K5, because you have the people that, you know, the true believers who, who you know, that was their baby, right. and then you have the people who uh, are responsible for getting, you know, these other folks <laughs> designed to market. So mm -hmm. that, it, it's hard to make a transition like that from, you know, between tape out and production, which is what we did. Okay. But it did free us up to, to you know, now that we knew that frequency was, was a target, we were uh, in a position to completely respin the, the architecture. And the, the K7 architecture is not anything like either the K6 or the K5. Mm -hmm. So uh, how much of the K, oh, actually I, I should step back for a second. How much of the 29,000 team wound up on the K5? Oh, I would say maybe 25% or so. Yeah. Now, when, once you pulled a lot of the team out of the 29K program, that after the 29030 and then the derivative of 035, uh, the super scale part, I think was Jaguar? It was called Jaguar. It yeah. n never really went much of anywhere. Yeah, it never got developed. Um, I remember arguing with uh, uh, Gene Ann Booth one time, because it always seemed to be five, always seemed to be five year, three years out. And it's like every, every time we talked to her, eh, another three years out. Um, but that, did that sort of pretty much kill the future on the, on the 29K program? Because you pull a, a fair amount of the core team out to, do, to go in the K5 and then K7. Right. Uh, it, didn't seem like, it seemed like it took a lot of the wind out of the sails of the 29K. Right. Yeah. But it was, it was really the only decision that AMD could have made because x86 parts pay for fabs and the 29K wouldn't. Yeah. And you know, vice versa. If if you don't have the fabs paid for by x86, oh, it, the design team isn't the big issue. The big issue is where you, where are you going to build the things? Yeah. Uh, but you know, it was the era when Jerry was still very much into having owning an own fab. I mean, if it had been a fa if it had been a fabless semiconductor manufacturer, it might have been different. But it, that's it. Might have been. Yeah. yeah. So did you? Did you uh, follow the 29K as it evolved or? And I, I was still in, involved. Yeah. I, I was heavily on K7 at the time. Yeah. And, but was still heavily involved in the product planning and, or, or basically architecture and uh, design of the 29K parts. Okay. And then um, who was on the K5 team? Let me get the. Oh man. <laughs> well, who do you remember off the top of your head? Uh, well, the the, it, the names, sort of the, the prominent ones are, you know, Dave Christie, Mike Goddard, Scott White, um, Dave Witt, and I'm, I'm leaving out lots of people just because it was a, actually a fairly sizable team in the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. But and uh, quite a few of them came from, from the x86 side of things, and okay. I, I, I didn't quite have all the, the, the background with them. Okay, um, and then, so as the K7 team developed, who of the K5 team went off the, to the early K7? Uh, let's see, it, this is kind of fuzzy in my mind, because yeah. initially it was Dave Witt and myself, mm -hmm. almost exclusively. Um, I think Dave Christie, uh, the others that I mentioned largely stayed on K5 mm -hmm. to, to help finish that up. Yeah. So, so we were doing the, the initial, uh, you know, microarchitecture and the concepts and uh, starting to ramp up the, the RTL team. And <clears throat> AMD went through this other, once the, K, the, the K7 officially launched, we had this, this massive hiring program. So the- Once K5 launched, do you mean? The, the, oh, once No, the, once we have- Launched the K7 the, program. The, once we decided to do K7. Yeah. We recruited, you know, just you know, massive numbers of, of new engineers, yeah. which is also kind of, you know, I I really wanted to use the K five team because you, you you develop a track record with right. them, you know, they they went off and were working on, you know, K five issues, and so we hired a new team to do K seven, and right in the middle of that, you know, next gen gets dropped in our our laps, and um, 
it was, let's say it was a chaotic to, to say the least. Yeah, that's got to be very disruptive. Yeah. So you said you found out about the K6 in the newspaper. Yeah. Um, and how, how did that impact uh, your work on the, on the K7? Well, the, um, they had made Atik Raza, who had been the CEO of NextGen, uh, the CTO of AMD, mm -hmm. and he, he really wanted me to, uh, to establish or form uh, an organization that would, uh, let's say, reflect Intel, Intel's architecture lab. So AMD didn't have an architecture lab. Intel mm -hmm. did. He thought we ought to you know, structure ourselves like Intel. Yeah. So, so he, this was a teak, not not Vin Don. This was most uh, mostly a teak. Yeah, because teak was CTO, and then Vin Don was more he ran the business unit. Right. Yeah. The 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 issue with Vin is I I, I had hired somebody from. Um, from digital equipment, uh, Dirk Meyer, mm -hmm. to um, as we were ramping up K7, he was one of the the, the senior technical people yeah. that that we hired at the time into my group. And my my interaction with Vin, let's say, was to make sure <laughs> that Dirk Meyer uh, took my place on K7 because you you really needed somebody with that that you know level of insight to what we were doing. Mm -hmm. it, it, it can't just be any, arch, let's say, any architect. It has to be somebody who really understands how all these moving parts fit together. Yeah. And so there was a period of time where, you know, I was on K7, Dirk worked for me. I was, you know, in some sense promoted. I, I was still a director, and Dirk mm -hmm. was promoted to a director working for me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then I was promoted to a VP under Atik and, you know, started the... Uh, Advanced Architecture Lab. Right. But did that pull you away from the sort of day-to-day -day K7 program? And oh, yeah. But, and but I, I had no issue trusting Dirk, Dirk yeah. to do that, which is, you know, why, I, which is why I didn't fight it so bad. You know, yeah. I, I didn't actually want to, you know, I didn't want to have a researchy type of, of role. Uh, but I really didn't want to see K, K7, you know, not not work out effectively because it had the wrong people in the, in 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 the leadership roles. Yeah, well, it, and and uh, I think I think the, um, the the proof was that Dirk did develop a pretty decent product. There. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. The K seven was really a, a sweet product. Right. Um, but then the K six was rolling out, and there was, so did you have much interaction with the K six team at that point, or was your group sort of separate, your research group? Well, we had. Um, they consulted with us on architectural issues with K6. Yeah. Uh, it was, I mean, it was it was a a friendly relationship, but we didn't really have. There wasn't a lot of influence either way on, mm -hmm. on us on them or yeah. or them on what we were doing because we ended up in the advanced architecture lab. You know, yes, we did some processor research. Uh, m more of it was platform based. Uh, starting to look at the question of 64-bit you know, x86 architectures. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it was, was collecting, collecting groups within AMD who had worked in other product areas, you know, particularly networking and communications. Okay. So from a professional standpoint, it was good for me because I got exposed to technology that I had had early on in, in my education. I had experience with you know, DSP and communications and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I hadn't, I'd been working on processors for, at that time, maybe 20 years. And so I got, got to go back into the, you know, wired and wireless communication and, and you know, telecommunications and, you know, DSL and home phone line networking and just lots of uh, interesting technologies. Mm -hmm. so, some of which uh, did pretty well for, you know, a period of time, but, yeah. but nothing that really resulted in, you know, a new product line, let's say. Hmm. So, did you feel that was is that somewhat disappointing that uh, that the stuff you worked on in the labs never quite made it into an AMD product? Oh, uh, sure, because yeah. <laughs> some of the things that we we developed, you know, well, w I mean, one of them was was a you know two chip 802.11b uh, chipset with C with CMOS RF. Yeah, and wow. it it was something that nobody in the world had, 
but at the time a AMD was distracted with x86 uh, but but we kind of we put together a, a I was able to attract marketing people and we had really great engineers it, mo most of the actual RF work was done in uh, Dresden Germany mm -hmm. So we, we started a fab, AMD started a fab in Dresden, and part of the agreement with the government there was that we would establish a research group, which, which I was responsible for. Mm -hmm. And you know, they're really, really, really good, uh, you know, methodical, you know, RF design type of engineers. So um, we literally got about two weeks away from uh, shipping that wireless LAN product. You know, we actually had the you know the boxes and all the packaging and all the, the the boards and everything, and AMD decided just you know, we're, even though at the time Intel was making a heavy push for their mobile platforms, you know you right. see the Centrino kiosks and all the uh, all the airports. That technology was was nowhere near as you know quote technically good as as what we were doing, but AMD just didn't have the wherewithal to, to you, Intel was spending hundreds of millions of dollars on that marketing program yeah. and we had great products but you know not, nowhere near the marketing input so you know that that sort of continued for for you know two or three years to the point where I just said yeah <laughs> I, I gotta go do something besides x86 processors because that's all that AMD is uh, going to be doing yeah the, uh, that's a shame they actually did have some uh, great early Wireless technology in the early stages, that, uh, um, uh, but uh, couldn't couldn't really commercialize. At that point in time, the market uh, was largely verticals, and then it was just starting to go broader uh, right. in terms of uh, and, and centri like the Centrino program, which you know kind of made it more pervasive to have wireless and then Wi-Fi as the, the brand came out. Right. But yeah, wh when I joined AMD, they had lots of product lines, right? The yeah. RAM, you know programmable logic and x86 and bit slice and networking and you know communications products you know slick slack I'm sure you know those oh yeah um, basically line card products I mean it, there, there was a lot going on and it was you know really interesting and around the time that I left they they had just you know everything else had been burned off you know and what, what was left was just this one you know this one product line which is where they made all the money and they they couldn't really afford the attention or the because their 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 cycles are always going up and down at the whims of Intel mm -hmm. they really couldn't sustain the the three years at a minimum that you need to establish any kind of new products so um, yeah. and, and to me just doing that for you know, the rest of my career would have been really boring I'm sure I could have done it you know, from a practical standpoint but I didn't want to and then so so eventually you, you decided to leave AMD. Oh, uh, effectively. What, yeah, what, what do we, I mean effectively sort of just, the, the uh, research group did that sort of uh, wind down in terms of funk, well, uh, funk the, well, the research group, uh, let's see, this was late. What time? Late 2004. I may be getting the time frame wrong. Yeah. Uh, it, it became another target of, you know, we, we need to cut people. So, so we had, we had a, a fairly massive layoff. <laughs> And my group was was hit pretty pretty hard, and uh, it was one of these things where you, know, you develop the relationship with lots of people, and you know that you, you just have to have these massive cuts. And at its peak, the group was 300, and it was cut back to about 90, I think. And then two weeks later, I was told <laughs> to cut all but about five. Wow. I mean, literally two weeks. And you just, to me, you don't do that. You don't don't do the kind of thing where you know you send a message that it's over and then come back and do it again. And I think within, if memory serves, I may be mixing up the timing a bit. I think within six months I was gone. So. Yeah. Did you just uh, you quit and what did you? And I, I quit and did no, did nothing for a while. Oh really? Yeah. So. And I I, I had a lot of. Uh, XAMD people that I knew at Texas yeah. Instruments. So, at the time, I was so uh, I just wanted to go do hands-on engineering because I'm I'm an engineer <laughs> effectively. <laughs> so so I got a you know, an emeritus title at TI and, and a job where I could 
I could get introductions to group and go around and, and you know, get exposed to all the DSP products and, and the, the wireless work that they were doing in. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a lot of fun for, for about five years and then OMAP started to get into trouble. Um, just, well, Nokia and TI both in some sense missed this transition from, uh, from you know, uh, let's say a baseband you know, microcontroller DSP that happened to do applications to a handheld computer that just happened to have a, a you know wireless uh, uh, wireless connection, yeah. and it, even though at some level these are all, these are all processing platforms, from the standpoint of of just the mindset of people, uh, the, the 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 mobile phone chipset and the you know let, let's say the, the the iPhone type of design are just culturally you know just you know they couldn't be more different and it's really hard to explain to to you know one set of e either side of that that right. that that cultural divide you can't explain what the others uh, mindsets are and I've been exposed to both and that sort of didn't matter I was you know that if, if, if you sympathize with both that means they both right? <laughs> it's, it's sort of you're not you're not the friend on either either side of the equation so so TI and Nokia got into uh, essentially started their decline because they just didn't make that transition from you know modem platform to computing platform. And hmm. Yeah, and um, and when they they tried to make the transition, they came came late to the party. Yeah, I, I would. My perception is they didn't they weren't that focused on what you have to do to make that transition. Yeah. And it's also, uh, it, it turned out to be a very competitive marketplace because you have oh, yeah. a tremendous amount of vendors who jumped into it. Um, and, uh, you know, and then of course you have the, the big player, Qualcomm, uh, which uh, wound up purchasing some AMD graphics chip after the AMD ATI merger. They, they took the mobile graphics core, became their Adreno. Right, and, and, and you have Google and Microsoft and Apple, which are computer companies building phones. Yeah. But they're not phones. <laughs> they're, they they have you know, phone functions yeah. and uh, wireless connections, but they're they're computers, and it, it's it's too much detail. But it, the the underlying platform design is is completely different between the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a different mentality. So um, and and so you spent some time at TI doing some work there, um, and then you know as TI started to ramp down their modem. Platform. What did you do next? Is, is oh, right? what I'm doing now. Okay. So the that you, where, where can you at least uh, give us a little inspiration, a little bit of the idea behind the inspiration of your new company, or did, what inspired you to do this project? Well, one of the at TI without revealing anything under at, yeah. at, at TI, I got I got to work on lots of different things for um, yeah. for lots of different products, and l largely OMAP four is wh where we had the most impact, mm -hmm. and T. TI was kind of interesting to me because they had you know really great engineering teams, you know, really, really good people, but they tended to be siloed, and I never really quite figured out why. They they knew each other personally, but I got into this role of well, you're doing this, and you're doing that, and you're doing that. Why don't you guys put this stuff together, you know, yeah. and we'll help you. Right. So, so we took took things that were already existing and put it put it, put them together in in. Uh, unique ways, mm. and you know, quite a few of the subsystems in OMAP 4. You know, nobody talks about it because it's they're, you know, embedded in, in the imaging and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, th there was a significant impact on on the architecture of the, the SOC platform because the application processor is largely what's licensed from ARM, mm -hmm. and so where where mo you can do most of the in innovation is in the the the, the media subsystems. Mm -hmm. And it's my involvement in the media some systems that got me doing what I'm doing now. Okay. Yeah, that, that's where a big differentiator is because uh, you can do a custom ARM design. In fact, AMD just announced they are doing a, uh, mm -hmm. an internal custom ARM design, and, and Qualcomm has, and uh, I, uh, Apple has. But uh, there's, it's a pretty well bounded problem. But this, in media processing, it's, it's a, a fairly unbounded problem. There's still a lot of interesting right. stuff you can in, do. There. In, in Particularly in image processing and and you know vision types apl types of applications, 
there's this huge gap between the algorithms because the researchers can can develop algorithms and, and prove their quality in, in you know however long it takes to to prove the quality you know that's very different than running these these very very complex applications in real time mm -hmm. and in my opinion now is there's this the only thing interesting that I can see I mean, from my perspective in computer architecture is this big gap between those types of applications and what what current computer architectures are capable of doing mm. and that's a really really hard problem and it's really interesting so it's kept me off the streets for three years now <laughs> <laughs> well it is an interesting segment I mean it's, there's many different ways to approach it. Uh, FP, even the FPGA vendors are going with a uh, rec reconfigurable logic uh, the uh, the uh, graphics vendors, the GPU vendors are going in after it with uh, uh, GPU compute. Right. Uh, the DSP guys are going after it with DSP processing. Uh, everybody's trying to crack that nut right now. It's a very interesting uh, uh, problem. Is that you think that's one of the most interesting problems right now in computer architecture? It's the only one that interests me. Yeah. And th there, there's just. A I'm familiar with all these approaches, and th th there's really a gap between what they can do and what's what's required. Mm -hmm. So, so um, and then in general, do we, what do you think about the state of the industry today? Um, because hmm. <laughs> you, you you almost have a uh, you've had a sort of an outsider view of it now that you've been kind of not you're not inside a company anymore. You got your own little outside consulting and looking at the, the big picture. When do you see the, I mean, this is obviously one of the big challenges, but do you think that's, uh, that everything else is kind of rote these days? Or it's not as, in, it's not it, as exciting it, to you? It, it, in some sense. Yeah. I mean, computer architecture has been static for for a long time. And, you know, yeah, there, you know, multi-core is, is, is the world's oldest new idea, right? <laughs> or, uh, you know, some version of you know, let's put thousands, hundreds or thousands of processors on the chip, and you know, somehow they will you know achieve a level of performance. And th th there are there are fundamental limitations there that can't. Uh, well, people will argue with this can't be overcome the way that that these things are architected. Mm -hmm. um, so you, the Amdahl's law problem. Uh, so you just refer, it, refer to basically, yeah. you, 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 you can't get away. The way these platforms are architected, with you know, let's say I have two cores, right? Th this one wants to read something, and, and this one's writing it, right? So, so the reader says, "Have you written yet? Have you written yet? Have you written yet? Have you written yet?" And the writer says, "You know, yes, I've written, uh, but wait, wait a while, so it, until it shows up where you can actually read it." Mm -hmm. And then it's a, this one says, "Okay, but now don't write again until." <laughs> Don't write again until I'm done reading. And are you done writing yet? Yes, I am. So that th there's no way to have that just happen like that. Well, yeah. there is, but that's what I'm working on. Mm -hmm. So um, let's uh, reflect back on uh, on your years at the 801, K, 29K, K5, and early K7. Um, what, what do you what, what do you uh, remember most fondly about those uh, those projects? Um, I liked working in the embedded market a heck of a lot <laughs> more than I liked it, the working in the PC market because in the embedded market you, you get to solve problems that people really have, mm -hmm. and in the computing market every, at some level everybody's doing computing they're all doing the same thing they're all bashing each other all the time, and and. Those computers already exist, and you can make them faster, and you know, add, you know, the next generation of USB or whatever. But in the embedded market, you can actually find cases where people have problems, and they, they don't even really know how to solve it because their their expertise has to do with whatever the embedded application is. Not they're not you know computer experts. Mm -hmm. So when you can you can find opportunities like that where somebody has a problem, and you can solve it with computer architecture. Yeah. To me, that's a lot more interesting than, you know, <laughs> building the next, you know, the next uh, PC platform product. Yeah. So, so it's solving real problems and with a, an engineering approach. So, so this kind of gets back to being an in engineer and approaching an engineering problem. Yeah. I mean, it's it's using architecture and other techniques as 
you know, to solve a need somebody has. Yeah. So, so that so it keeps you still excited about being an engineer and oh, yeah. solving problems. Um, anything else looking back on the old programs that uh, you, you have any? I mean, obviously you said uh, was there anything specifically about the Coin K program, K five program that that uh, that you sort of uh, reminisce about, or it was just a, how the design team? Did you see any of the design team members much at all down in Austin? Um, quite a few of them. Yeah, or at least the the ones that I interacted with most. Yeah, and we have the occasional reunion. <laughs> Have any thought of? Uh, I think there is an open so open source version of the 29K. Any, any thoughts that it might? It would be interesting if anybody followed up on that. Or you think it's the architecture is pretty much dead? It's not nothing much interesting to do with it. Um, it, it there are a lot of things like it. I'm not. It, it, I mean, a lot of things. If, if you if you really dig under the covers of what companies like TI were doing, I mean, they they had special spins of processors all over the place. So. Mm -hmm. the, at this point, there's nothing unique about the 29K compared to quite a few other things. Hmm. And then, um, uh, any other like kind of an aha moment you had along the along your career that uh, sticks out in your mind? <laughs> the branch target cache was one of those. It was sort of, it was sort of a combination of a, a, a two of you. Oh, I don't know. I think the funniest one is, I mean, we we kind of touched briefly on me being at Stanford. Yeah. Uh, I, I I went to classes for like two years and got got to the point where I was really burned out, as you might imagine, because I, yeah. I was traveling all the time. And, you know, Stanford graduate studies isn't the easiest thing in the world. And I definitely wasn't the, sm the smartest person in, in, in you know, my, uh, among my classmates. And I was in a completely different situation. You know, they were, they were, you know, students. I was, you know, I had a family and a yeah. house and mortgage and that kind of thing. And, and a job, too. And a, and a job. Yeah. <laughs> and um, one summer, I, I came really close to quitting. Okay, so so I had been taking classes, you know, every every um, semester, or qu I think they're, they're on a quarter system, yeah. every quarter, um, and including the summer. And one, the, 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 the second, I went to, through that for two years, and, and during the summer, I just I, I was on the verge of quitting, so I didn't take any classes, and kind of just took the summer off. And I, I knew that if I went back, I'd have to pick a research topic. Um, and I had no clue <laughs> what I was going to pick as a research topic. <laughs> so I was I, I had driven into AMD, and I got out of the car once, and I still remember it hit me like a bolt of lightning. It's like, why don't you look at multiple instruction execution per clock? <laughs> I go like. Yeah, well, that's an interesting problem, and it's kind of silly too. And of course, the first thing you know that that um, I mentioned it to a few people, and everybody I mentioned it to laughed. Uh, <laughs> you know, they thought they thought I was joking. It's like yeah. you know, you can't it can't be done, right? So, but I said, you know, look, I'm I'm here. You know, I'm going to Stanford. I'm working with a lot of smart people, and um, it seems like an interesting problem to me. Um, so. So I would say that's the one aha moment that, that became, you know, it, again, I was, it was told by several people that, you know, it was silly, crazy, you know, couldn't be done. Wow. Because it was, it was a complete, it was a complete shift from the way people had, or, or if you could do it, it'd be too complex and so forth and so on. But, yeah. but now, you know, pick up any PC and that's, that, that's the fundamental implementation under the covers. Yeah, it, it's hard to go back and look at that and say super scale of design. It seemed, it's it's so ubiquitous and so uh, obvious today, but it was it was still very difficult engineering problem or considered as such back then. Right, and then that was still in, it was that was still an in order uh, superscalar, right? You need to do an, your your book didn't. I don't know. If, did you cover out order? Oh yeah, yeah. That, okay. that was actually oh the more the, complex part. Yeah, that was actually the main. Well, there there were effectively in order superscalar concept at the time yeah. but for the most part they were you know integer and floating point paired instructions right yeah. and so it's pr it's somewhat obvious that was the 860 it was paired like that right so so the interesting problem is you know let's say it's any set of instructions up to a certain number not yeah. not necessarily two and not necessarily you know integer floating point type of uh, partition mm -hmm. so that that was the you know 
gee, I wonder if there's a you know solution to that problem that led to the all the other things that I did in that area. That but, it? but it literally was just you know, oh, that'd be cool. <laughs> And, then and, that, and I got to have some topic. Yeah. Well, you didn't pick a super easy one, so it was still a fairly complex problem to solve. I yeah. Mean, was, but it made it interesting. Yeah. Cool. Um, so have you counted how many patents you hold? Do you have a Yeah, I lost count? count. I lost count at 80 something. Yeah. You should update that for your resume. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I, I wanted to lowball it. Uh, yeah, what he's referring to is my my resume says over fifty patents, and I'm sure it's well over fifty. Yeah. But I don't know how many it is, and I don't want to lie. So, no. <laughs> um, and then uh, so uh, we're kind of kind of wrapping up here. But how would you summarize your career? What would you how would you describe how you got into this crazy business? Um, just being really excited about <laughs> learning new things, and and being bored if they're not new. <laughs> Yeah. And that's really what it comes down to. So you have a low threshold of boredom is basically what you're saying. Yeah. I, I've told a lot of people I, I'm edge triggered. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, um, so uh, we're here at the Computer History Museum, and I, I know you haven't had a chance to, to look through it yet, but uh, what do you think of the importance of kind of capturing the history of of, of the computer business and the microprocessor business? Well, I, I think it's pretty important because the, the interesting thing about computers is they've created this, this infrastructure that's basically very ephemeral. You know, you, you can go, you can read paper documents that go back thousands, not thousands, hundreds of years, mm -hmm. and they're still, you know, still paper, you know, you, you can still access them. I mean, you go back, you go back 10 years and there's all this information stored on computers that's t just totally inaccessible, and um, I think it's getting even worse. It's getting even worse as, as you know standards change and so forth. This all this, I, I just went through the process of upgrading from XP to Windows 8.1. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, trying a, to that's a big job. Just trying to preserve you know the information you had in XP in the eight, eight, in the Windows 8.1. It, it, it's a painful path. And that's that's you know in theory a, compa a compatible platform. So it, it's only getting worse as things get more complicated and and you know the, the, all the media change and that kind of thing. And so it, it's easy for this information. It, it's a little bit ironic, but it's easy for all this information to get lost unless you're really really trying to preserve it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't want we don't want to lose uh, sight of some of the history and how it was made and, and how the people who made it. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of what, the, what this program is all about. Mm -hmm. Well, Mike, I'd like to thank you very much for spending this time with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, are we off? Can be. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for spending our, the time with us here at the Computer History Museum. Um, I'd like to thank you and uh, hope to follow on sometime in the future with a 29K program and a K5 uh, panel as well. Yeah, sure, thanks. Okay. Bye.